Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the JPS Education Portal. And we are here with Dr. Mike the Second, aka Dr. Mike Banner. Welcome, Mike. Thank you very much. And we're also joined by Samuel. And today we're going to be discussing stress. So, Mike, I guess give the listeners a little bit of a background as to what you do as a profession and your trade, and then we can uh, take the discussion from there. Sure. So I'm a um, I'm a GP in the UK uh, working in the NHS, which is our kind of government health uh, service. Um, and it's like primary care doctor. So I deal with all of the initial problems that people will have. Uh, my particular areas of interest are mainly mental health, um, a few other bits as well, like men's health, too. And I've kind of got this background interest in like lifestyle and behavior change and stuff like that, just mainly down to just personal interest. I work with the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine, um, basically trying to encourage uh, health professionals, but also the general public to take a more active role in trying to use lifestyle change to help manage and perhaps even prevent uh, chronic illness and stuff like that and improve health. And a lot of this uh, from what I learned about you in Singapore was, uh, I guess, because of your own personal experience and journey uh, on your health improvement. Is that correct? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, I I kind of grew up with very little interest in in health and fitness and and kind of managing my own health. And I think that that's not uncommon for a lot of people. Like in you know in childhood and adolescence, we don't really have this kind of recognition of our own mortality. We feel mostly just invincible and aren't aren't too concerned about the future. And then as time goes on, we kind of start to perhaps recognise that maybe we need to be thinking a little bit more about illness prevention and all of that sort of stuff as well. Um, and by the time I kind of came to that realization, I was already, you know, very over, very overweight, like completely inactive, no interest in things like nutrition. And when I decided to make changes, I was pretty shocked, actually, because I think in my mind I had I had this idea that because I was a doctor, I kind of knew what, you know, I, I knew what I was doing and I could change. I could sort it out at any time. And as soon as I kind of clicked my fingers, it would all kind of fall into place. Um, and then obviously the reality of that was was very different. And I kind of was you know, involved in trying to find out what I was supposed to do, taking advice from coaches that perhaps weren't as knowledgeable as, um, you know, maybe you guys, and, uh, you know, ended up doing some things like from a dietary perspective uh, and a fitness perspective that that was really suboptimal, um, you know, to put it politely. And uh, it kind of gave me this insight into the fact that maybe as health professionals, we don't know as much as maybe we should or maybe I would like to know about it. So I sort of set out to learn a little bit more about how to understand those things. And kind of part of that journey ended up with me kind of using, you know, using that kind of process to educate other people on things that maybe I knew stuff about that they didn't know so much about, make myself awesome. feel better about myself. It's very cool. And I must say that when I heard that for the first time at the Expo conference, I was very shocked. And I guess the overall intellectual humility um you know that comes from somebody uh, in your position um you know going through that process is, is very cool so to get into today's topic uh stress what can you tell us about stress mike i guess if we want to start with some definitions and maybe the different types of stress sure i mean i th i think like the hardest thing about stress is that it's a it's a word that we kind of band around all the time yeah. like I'm stressed or I'm under stress or or whatever that that we don't actually take a lot of time to really think about what it is what we can do about it I think that most people don't necessarily make that much effort to actively manage it because I think it's something that we've we've become accustomed to and we sort of have decided that it's just a part of normal life and you can't really prevent it um so you know stress to me is kind of how how we feel when we're in situations that we don't have control over I think is probably uh you know a, a, a pretty basic way of describing it it's a, sort of a feeling of being I guess hyper aroused like kind of just feeling more alert more um you know not relaxed basically it's it's even like it's it's hard to define without without using google and wikipedia I think even you know from a from a health perspective yeah no I, de I definitely agree that people just throw the term around um without actually understanding it but uh yeah from my knowledge you know we have stress being the body's adaptive 
response to a challenge or demand. At least that's mm-hmm. my understanding in the context of uh, exercise and sports science, right? Um, and stress can be broken down into acute stresses, chronic stresses, and we also have eustress, which is like a positive type of stress. So I guess, Mike, um, you know, when does stress become something that can potentially negatively impact somebody's health? And what are your thoughts around that? Well, I think it, it comes down to what type of stress it is, firstly, but also how long it's lasting, how intense it is. I mean, you can have people that can have, um, you know, an acute stress reaction to a single event. You can have somebody that, you know, I people call these things often like different things, but like in the ICD criteria, it'd be described as an acute stress reaction. But people might hear about people talking about things like, you know, nervous breakdowns and stuff like that. Yeah. And these are sorts of reactions where you can totally kind of shut down, you know, for a period of, I mean, it can be minutes, it can be hours, it can be days, it can be weeks, it can be even longer than that. Um, and I think that, you know, it can range, like stress can range from something that has a very minimal effect on us that maybe just makes our day a little bit more difficult to something that actually affects our health. I think that the 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 fact of, like when we look at stress in terms of a like from a physiological perspective and the hormone effects that it has on the body it has effects on all of the like pretty much all of the different systems like it affects our digestive system it affects our muscular system in terms of you know our movements and things like that as well um it can even affect stuff like you know glucose metabolism and things like that and without kind of getting into the depth of physiology um it you know it, it really depends on how ongoing that issue is. So like if you're stressed for, you know, for a few minutes because you're having a tough day at work, then that's one thing. But if you're stressed all day, every day, then that's going to have, you know, perhaps long, longer lasting effects. But it's hard to define those things. Again, like stress is a bit like things, you know, like, like when we talk about diet and nutrition and obesity and all of these things, it plays into so many other factors as well. Like, is it just the stress that's going to be causing those kind of ongoing nutritional issues that you might have from a digestive perspective? Or is it the fact that because you are more stressed, you're more likely to do other things associated with stress, like drinking more alcohol or eating more processed foods and stuff like that. So it's quite difficult to kind of um, tease out the individual specific effects. Um, But I guess like what we can say about it is that when left uncontrolled and when left unaddressed, it does have negative effects on our body and, and how we function. So it's worth trying to do what we can to mitigate it where possible. Yeah, for sure. And I think the management of stress becomes more important when those symptoms of stress are lasting, you know, whether it's interfering with your everyday life, if it's causing you to avoid certain things or you're unable to be present, whatever it may be. It's like when you're experiencing those symptoms and they're negatively impacting life, then you absolutely have to, you know, be proactive in mitigating it. But you obviously want to prevent stress as well. So I guess, you know, Mike, when it comes to managing stress, what are some of the things that you advise patients if they're dealing with situations where, you know, stress is high and it could potentially impact their health? Yeah, well, I mean, like, interestingly, it's got a lot of overlaps with a lot of other kind of mental health conditions or mental health you know um symptoms things like anxiety things like depression and so well let's sorry to interrupt mike well let's just divert just for a second because i think that's a really important point and distinction to make between stress and anxiety what would you how would you distinguish between those two things when a patient comes in um i think it's it's mainly based around kind of the circumstances like so just to kind of clarify for anyone who's listening it's 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 tough to talk about anxiety because anxiety the word itself is an emotion feeling anxious um having anxiety itself is a very normal thing for people to do all of us will feel anxiety at some point um but when we often speak about anxiety you know day to day we what we often mean is anxiety disorder people who are suffering with anxiety as an actual you know pathological issue rather than you know a day-to-day emotion um and although it's very difficult to differentiate between those two things the kind of important thing to do is is to differentiate with them because we're talking about the difference between an actual problem that needs remedying and just a you know a, a, a day-to-day life issue that needs managing like it does for anybody else um so 
I think like a useful way of looking at things like the difference between anxiety and anxiety disorder is looking at what is it that that makes people anxious. So, for example, if you if if somebody is getting anxious because they're you know going on stage and performing in front of a huge crowd, um, that's quite a normal situation in which to feel anxious. But if people are feeling anxious, you know, going to the shops to buy a loaf of bread. Um, or bumping into somebody that they might know in the street or or, or going to just a, a normal social gathering, then it's a very different process and, and, and suggests a very different kind of level of, of anxiety. But just to, to come back to your original question about um, defining the difference, I mean, it, like, again, it, it, it's often, I think, based on the circumstances. So if somebody comes to see me because they're having an awful lot of problems at work and they are struggling with, um, you know, situations that are happening at work, whether it's you know, to do with bullying or to do with a huge workload or to do with being under-resourced or understaffed or whatever. Um, and it's making them feel very similar symptoms actually to to to, to anxiety. Um, then that's going to be a different situation to if they're also feeling that way all the time. So like, for example, if somebody says, oh, you know, I feel a little bit better on the weekend, it seems that sounds more like work-related stress. Often the stress is in the moment um, so, you know, if, if people are getting stressed because they have to look after three kids all day while their partner's at work, and then when their partner comes back from work, you know, things kind of de-escalate a little bit, they've got a little bit of help, they can relax a little bit more. You know, those are the, the kind of differences between feeling kind of under stress. Under stress is when there's a problem that's happening that you're having to manage. And I think anxiety is more when you, it's, it's more just that, the feeling. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So without out of the way, what are some of the strategies that you think are effective for helping people manage stress um, you know, when they present to you with situations where there's something in their control that they can obviously do about it? I, again, it, I think it depends on the situation, but you know, for the most part, it's about actually figuring out what the underlying cause of that stress is and trying to address what that is. And often that's like a structural life thing, right? And sometimes, and actually, I, I would argue that in probably the majority of cases, it's something that isn't, you can't fix, you can't fix the underlying issue. Like the underlying issue is that the fact that you, you know, you might work in a job that is really stressful. And you might have decided that you want to stay in that career, regardless of how stressful it is. And the solution might be, I oh, switch careers, you know, you know, go, go and get a completely different job and that's not necessarily a workable or realistic solution for people again if someone's a single parent for example if they've they've found themselves in a situation that they didn't necessarily intend to end up in but they suddenly find themselves needing to care for let's say you know three or four kids on their own um you know like the idea of them being able to do something to fix the fact that they're stressed is pretty unrealistic unless they have access to you know things like help with childcare and stuff like that in which case they might not feel stressed in the first place but i think there are often things that we can do to try and mitigate it as much as possible like techniques like relaxation techniques mindfulness gratitude meditation all of that sort of stuff as well to try and kind of manage how we absorb uh, and use that stress and also trying to avoid things that actually add to the problem. So we mentioned things like alcohol before, diet and stuff like that. Often often we tend to address stressful situations in not particularly healthy ways that perhaps we feel are helping us in some way, but actually are probably compounding the issue either in the same way or in other ways. So, you know, substances, um, comfort eating, not doing physical activity or exercise again which is difficult to do because it sometimes can feel stressful to try and incorporate physical activity into a day when you're already stressed um, but the benefits of doing all of those things or you know avoiding the things that are harmful are really beneficial so i think that what often people get stuck in the idea of is that the stressful situation is not fixable therefore the stress is not fixable um but even if you can't fix it entirely, there are still things that you can do to try and, you know, counteract it somewhat. Yeah, I like that. I certainly like the distinction between things that make your stresses worse and trying to actively avoid those and then the things that will help your overall tolerance or at least resilience to stress and trying to, you know, seek out those more. Samuel, 
you and I obviously work with a lot of clients who are stressed and help manage uh, their stress in some ways. Although we, we add stress to their overall existence by hurting them in the gym. Um, but what's some of the, some of the, I guess, key things that you advise your clients when you know they're under the pump, whether it be with work, kids, um, and obviously managing that with their you know training and nutrition? So I do think, like Mike kind of alluded to this earlier, where there are some stresses that are far further out of our control and some that are well within our control. And I think like having a healthy amount of stress is probably not only uh, normal, but completely necessary for nearly everyone. I think at some level, I mean, Mike, you studied, you went to university. I'm sure that was stressful, right? Exams are stressful. Um, I think that stress and pressure can be a good thing at times, right? But again, like a lot of things, moderation is probably the key. So sometimes, you know, when we're working with clients and we're like, you know, trying to practically advise them in a way that empowers them, sometimes flipping the script on how they view their stress is a big one. Just, you know, again, being mindful, like journaling, taking a step back, like gaining perspective on the situation. Like, what are you stressed about? Why is this stressful? Um, and digging a little bit deeper to unpack it and try and gain perspective on, okay, is this really all that bad? Or is it, we're just having a bit of a, a response, a reaction. It's a pretty normal thing to do when we're a bit overwhelmed um, and how can we, you know, proceed in a way that is more productive, right? Because I think one of the biggest things that we struggle with on the gym floor working with clients is when we see people who report making, you know, unconscious, irrational, illogical decisions because of stress. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I, I, I did this, I ate this because I'm stressed. And it's like, okay, well, how can we overcome that, right? How can we start to identify the things that will trigger those behaviors, right? You, if you're, you know, you go to chocolate or, you know, wine or to substances and whatever it is, if we can start to draw attention to it, right? Because stress is normal. Stress is always going to be there, right? If you have kids, they're always going to stress you. If you have a job, it's probably always going to be stressful if you care about it. So I think sometimes the attitude of trying to eradicate it completely is it's erroneous. Like we want to, we want to deal with it effectively and come up with strategies that allow us to use the stress in a productive and healthy way rather than running from it and being fearful of it. So yeah, the mindfulness stuff, perspective things, trying to unpack it with clients is a big one. Just generally trying to find clues, like the types of things that, repeatedly come up and then working with them to say, okay, well, how can we change the response to the stress? You, you try and you normally go for wine. Why don't we go for a walk? Why don't we have a shower and brush your teeth, right? Trying to just remind them of the things that they can do to help deal with the stress that also won't compound and add more stress is a big one, right? Like you don't want them to, like Mike said, you know, they do like they're under stress and they do something that adds more stress and they're just feeling that, you know, their stress bucket to the point that it eventually they have that nervous breakdown. It's completely overfilmed and they can't cope anymore. Right. And I think when it comes to training, you know, or like, you know, worrying about nutrition, like they're stresses, they're additional stresses that we add in. So I think as coaches and practitioners, it's important to then understand okay, when is it too much to add some of these healthy stresses in? Is now the right time to be worrying about a fat loss phase, right? Should we be training really hard if, you know, they're really stressed and they're having a really rough time because their partner's overseas, right? I think this is where understanding, you know, the background of training, nutrition, and like small amounts of psychology are probably beneficial for coaches, right? Because if you know that, you know, someone's like very highly stressed, work is completely ridiculous, their family life is hectic, 
and they come to you saying, I want to lose five kilos. And you just like, you look at it and go, this is completely impractical. That's where a good professional may just say, Hey, let's, let's just focus on that. When, you know, your partner comes back when work settles down, because now it just might be a little bit too hard and we don't want to set you up for failure and being able to Mm -hmm. have those conversations and navigate uh, the, the stressful outcome and the response um, with clients in a way that is productive and empowers them to also feel like they're okay to be stressed and they're not like, you know, I I like a lot of the things you raised there, but an interesting thought I had just then was being able to determine whether or not somebody should pursue a fat loss phase or whatnot, because they're already under a lot of stress when in fact that might actually decrease the stress, decrease the stress. Right. So it's like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't in mm-hmm. some of those situations. And I guess, uh, Mike, I'll put it to you. In, in the situation where you have someone where it's like, okay, this person's really stressed right now. They're going through a lot, maybe a fat loss phase or maybe something like, you know, trying to increase their activity isn't really feasible and could add extra stress hypothetically. Um, but it also could improve their ability to tolerate stress and improve their health and have so many benefits and they need to do it. How do you navigate a situation like that? Because that's a very realistic situation these days, you know. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I think that um I think it's difficult because you know, you, you mentioned fat loss specifically, and I think that like we exist in a society where, you know, the fat loss to most people is the pinnacle of of health seeking behavior. It is. But actually it is, in, that's in, why. Yeah. But actually in reality, <laughs> Well, I mean, I think for a lot of people it is, you know, in, yeah. the reality is for a lot of people, um, you know, obesity is the biggest health challenge that they have. And if they can overcome that, then actually it will, you know, a lot of things will improve. But I think the key is, which you touched on, is is how we actually do that. Like it's, you know, just just losing five kilos necessarily isn't isn't healthy in itself. How you lose those five kilos, you know, can, you, you know, you're talking about the difference. Somebody can lose five kilos of you know, of water weight by taking you laxatives. Just cut a leg off. Yeah, well, exactly. But how, you know, if, you, if you're if you improving their diet and you're increasing their physical activity and you're improving their health behaviours, then, you know, you are, it's not just the five kilos that you're losing, it's all of the other stuff that comes along with it as well. So I think that it is important to think about that. And I think that what you can do in, in those situations where somebody wants to lose five kilos, actually that five kilos is a source of stress for them. Um but what you can do is you can focus hard on, you know, try and reframe what the goal is rather than saying, OK, well, like perhaps now with everything that's going on in your life at the moment, the loss of the five kilos isn't actually what the goal is. The improvement in your health and your weight and your stress and all of those sorts of things is what the goal is. So actually, we're going to take a slightly more stepwise approach. And instead of the goal being five kilos, the goal is going to be getting 10,000 steps a day or um, the goal is going to be eating you know five portions of fruit and vegetables every day these things will invariably lead to some fat loss right if you know depending on what the, the dietary situation is of that person but actually if you sit down with that person and have a lifestyle consultation and figure out what their lifestyle looks like you know you can do things within that lifestyle that will improve their stress that will likely lead to some weight loss as well. So you're ticking some of those boxes for them, but you're not necessarily saying, yep, we're going to go on an eight week shred um, and do a, do a photo shoot at the end of it. But you're going to say, right, we're just going to take it a little bit slowly at the moment and put some measures into place so that when all of those measures are in place, we can focus in, you know, more aggressively on that, that fat loss. Um, And so for example, if you sit down with somebody and, and they're under a huge amount of stress, their partner's away, And what they're doing is they're spending all day looking after the kids then they're putting the kids to bed and then they're eating like a, you know, giant bag of Doritos and and five glasses of rosé. Those are the things that you can focus on rather than saying like, right, we're going to put you on a, you know, this specific kind of training program and, you know, a chicken and broccoli diet, for example. So I think that the, the, the important thing is, is that all of this stuff kind of goes hand in hand. And actually, if you are someone who is a um you know a super clued up coach and and you want to sit and have an individualized approach with somebody then you're going to find things within that lifestyle that you can address that will both 
improve the stress that that person is under lead to some weight loss as a bit of a compromise maybe not five kilos in in two weeks but some some weight loss so that they're moving in the right direction and then when the other things fall into place and when they are less stressed then you can maybe go more aggressively on it three things there i i agree with all of what you said mike uh three things one i don't think most people would be stressed if their partner left i think some people really enjoy that that's my first thing um second thing is uh, I realized that a big part of, uh, I guess, adding stress to somebody's life when you're helping them with a goal um, in training nutrition is whether or not they are heavily focused on the outcome versus the process. I think people who are highly fixated on outcome goals um, and only focused on those are the ones who get more stressed out by having that goal in place um it's because it's you can't take action on it you're a long way away from it you need to go through all these steps and processes to get there and it's out of your control so they're the people who generally feel more stress when that goal's added in and i guess the third thing is that um you know tied to having outcome versus process goals is you really need to focus on what's in your control as opposed to what isn't in your control um and the approach that we take is the most important thing for whether or not something's going to add stress to somebody's life. So if we're ha- setting this outcome goal, we focus on the process, you can still make it stressful by having an overly stringent or extremely restrictive approach versus an approach that's like, okay, let's just add an extra thousand steps per day. Okay. Can we just have a little bit more vegetables or can we try to have one less you know, piece of chocolate in the evening? right? Versus I need you to track your calories and macros to the gram because you could mm-hmm. have the outcome goal, but focus on the process. Um, and, but then have a really restrictive overbearing approach and that's going to stress you out. Mm-hmm. So I think it's looking at those things separately is okay. We've got an outcome goal. Great. Does it sort of work with our current setup now? Is that goal going to stress me out more? Um, can I focus on the process enough to let the outcome take care of itself? And then is the approach that we take, in terms of the X and O's of the training program, how many days a week you can exercise, the intensity, your nutrition setup, all those kind of things, what variables you're going to measure. Does that, is that feasible and sustainable given my current situation? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where people go wrong is they try to have a goal at the wrong time. They focus too much on the outcome, not on the process. And then they adopt an extremely restrictive and overbearing approach that just isn't practical their current situation that makes it hard to follow which stresses them out further because they can't achieve the outcome goal and it's not moving in the direction they want so they try to restrict even more but that gets even harder and then it's just a self-perpetuating cycle so i think yeah that is is a lot of the issue any thoughts on that samuel anything you want to add um no i do generally agree i think mike really summarized it accurately sometimes the the process of doing the work i think oh sorry let me backtrack sometimes people mistake the things that actually cause them stress they like they boil it down to like one thing like i mean at least for us in a gym setting certainly maybe not a medical setting like people come in like oh you know the biggest the biggest stressor that they want to address is I want to lose, you know, we use that five kilo example, but it's like, if you unpack it, it's actually, you know, they don't feel good in their clothes. They don't, they're not comfortable and confident in the way that they look. And it's like, okay, so it's like sort of weight related, but it's like, if you did other things, it, that would be resolved. And then we can just, you'll just see substantial improvements generally. Right, like you know, one thing I, I'll be happy when I lo- get to this weight. Right, how often do we hear that? I'll be happy when I weigh, you know, seventy-five. I'll be happy when I weigh fifty-five. And it's like, oh, okay, like, what happens if you get? And I always say to my clients, what happens if you get there and you're not happy? Right, because like, I mean, Mike, you've trained. Have you ever met someone who's like lifted a weight? I'll be happy when I hit, you know, a hundred kilo bench press. I've never ever met someone who was like. Retire. Right, I'm I'm, I'm satisfied. <laughs> I did. I bench. I I hit that PB, and now I I don't want to do anything beyond that. I'm laughing like, oh, because I did that. I what? wanted to, you did. You're yeah, sick. Though. I sort of did that. I got to a hundred kilo bench press, and then I was like, I'm done. 
you never, you never have to do it anymore. Normal. I mean, I think I only have, because, the, no, no, the no, only no, one to, person to, in the world who's done that is on the call. To just, <laughs> to just clarify, <laughs> I, I think like there are certain things that like. I think having little arbitrary goals along the yeah. way can be they're, really they're useful. valuable. And to, yeah, of course. And, and to me, I was like, there was there was a. I, I I think it depends how you frame it. Like I've had a few little a few little goals in my life, like that have been a bit like that. Like I've been like, do you know what? I want to know. Have you run a marathon or a I half feel. marathon? No, no, not, not yet. yet. Not yet. So, Mike, Mike, <laughs> only because it's. That's too difficult. But I but had, I like, I this. had in my mind, I was like, I don't, I said, I, I want for one, I want to see what my abs look like. And then I'm done. I want to, I want to have, I want to be able to squat and bench press. But you're, so, okay. Because. Let me, but not I'm done. Let I me unpick it. Like, I didn't stop training. No, exactly. Let me unpick it. It's like you're shifting the goalpost. You're not quitting. Exactly. Right? No, absolutely. So absolutely, you're, that's right. which is, the message that I was getting to. It's like, people don't just yeah. get like, Oh, do this thing. And like, I'll stop training now. Then I'm yeah, like, no, I you know, get to a certain weight and immediately become happy. It's like the process of achieving things and trying to do things that are positive health promoting, you know, for you. Right. At least all those good things. That to other, other there, goals yeah. And, you can shift yeah. the, the, uh, the focus and i think it's important that you yeah, shift the focus right because that's what keeps it interesting and entertaining but if you know you're you're always like hinging your happiness on losing weight losing weight losing weight at some point you die if you lose too much weight right exactly so that can't always be the goal right so but, and also you, that some of those things the goals aren't sustainable so that's that's yeah. i think why it's important to shift those things so like for example you might want to you know you might want to get a six pack, but it doesn't mean you, you want to then measure Maintain your success it. for the rest of your life on whether or not you continue to have a six pack, for example. And the same you don't with measure like, success like that. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends on the situation. But yeah, no, absolutely not. But in um, but like for example, with you know, with stuff like it, it's about kind of I, I think having those kind of side quests and side goals is really important side because quests. it also yeah, yeah, you're exactly. on side quests now. Like we that. re-established this. You're on because side my, quests now. My side quest was to get a hundred kilo bench press because I'm not a power lifter. I'm not, you know, it's not it's not so important to me at, overall to be able to bench press a hundred kilos. But at the time when that was my goal, I was like, look, you have you know, you have to move away from having specific weight related goals because it's just it's boring and it's not necessarily doing you any good. But what would be a goal that would lead to you? training a little bit harder, training with a bit more intensity, um, you know, having a sort of a different goal, which is not potentially causing you harm mm. at the same time. And that's something like, you know, you know, like a, a non-scale victory that, you know, we often call it, for example. And so I think having those little side things is, is, is really, really important, but also keeping them in perspective with, with other yeah. stuff too. And like you say, not just going, okay, I've, I've benched a hundred kilos now. I don't have to I'm train done. anymore. I agree completely, but yeah. Um, a really good point there that you raised, Mike, was that having the appropriate perspective. And I think that given that you're an intelligent human being and you're also quite a logical and rational person from... Sometimes. Um, yeah, sometimes. From what I understand, anyway, um, that's why you're able to shift the goalpost. Whereas some people really, really struggle with having a goal beyond whatever goal they've set. They become so fixated on it. Uh, it's a be all end all and nothing else in the world matters. It's just like, that's it. They get that tunnel vision. Um, and I think that's when we certainly, yeah, those are hard situations to do with. But, but that's where product. I think, I think most people, I think generally, and, and again, I don't want to give myself too much credit because a lot of these things that have happened in terms of my goals and the shifting of my goals have happened because I've continued to work with decent coaches. Yeah. And I think often it's the kind of stuff where like in my head, I'll be like, I need to go on a diet. I need to, you know, I need yeah. to lose 10 kilos. Whereas it's, it will often be the coach, the objective person in that situation who you trust, who you know is looking out for your best interests, who then helps you reframe those things. So I think it's not just about necessarily being, like, I don't think any of us are rational or intelligent when it comes to Outside, like that yeah, subjective yeah, yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I think it's I, i'm i'm great at giving advice to other people on this stuff but i think when it comes to ourselves it's very difficult yeah. to be objective so i think that that's where it's important to have other opinions too it's like you start falling into those logical fallacies where you start to think oh well i know 
particularly, you know, if you're educated, you're, you're like you said, at the very start of the call, you come from a health background. So I understand health. I understand fitness. I get it. So I can address it at any point in time, yeah. but it doesn't quite work like that. hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. So I guess uh, in terms of the mental health side of things, um, yeah. What impact can stress have on our mental health? Mark, and you know, are the same strategies that you listed earlier as effective for the mental health side of things or are there different strategies? What's your take there? I think it's a, like it depends on the on on the person for sure. I think there are a lot of people who have a huge capacity to shoulder enormous amounts of stress, and it doesn't seem to affect their mental health very much. Um, but I think whether it actually is or not is really something that's that's only really known to the person. I think we're very good at displaying certain aspects of ourselves and and hiding other aspects of ourselves too. So I think the important thing to remember is that that chronic stress can have a significant impact on our mental health. Um, you know, we even like to the level of things like post-traumatic stress disorder, like stress and trauma are kind of, you know, two kind of slightly interchanging things. So actually, you know, acute stress can be can be like a like an acute trauma. But that kind of chronic stress can really can really affect how how we process things, how we process events, um, how we process kind of other things that are happening in our lives. Um, and I think it can lead to it can lead to, to, you know, to more general feelings of anxiety and stuff as well, particularly when it's when it's not addressed, because if you're constantly in that kind of heightened state of that, like hyper arousal, you just become quite accustomed to it, I think. And you end up sort of feeling a bit more, you know, generally anxious, generally under pressure. Um, sometimes it can lead to avoidance of certain things, avoidance of of um you know like social avoidance stuff like that as well um there's there's huge amounts of stuff that it can do that that can affect mental health but again it's so multifactorial like you're thinking about genetic factors other environmental factors um you know your general behavior i mean it was interesting like what you were talking about earlier with regards to talking about stress management and kind of reframing the behaviors that result of, of what when we feel stressed like instead of eating chocolate doing this for example like you're basically in, in some ways describing the the structure of like cognitive behavioral therapy or you're, you're talking about taking situations and reframing how we process them and then reframing the behavior that results from them so you know there's a lot of crossover between talking about stress and talking about things like anxiety and depression as well um, and a lot of the things that will help us manage our stress will also have impact on 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 those things, too, because even if, you know, if you have an underlying depression or an underlying anxiety, but you add stress into it, it's going to make it worse. Right. So if you can reduce either of those things, you're ultimately going to feel better. And I think we talked about outcome outcome goals. I think everyone's main outcome goal is to be happier. Right. Or to be happy. Generally, it's just that what we believe is the thing that will make us happy is very different from person to person for some people you know it's money for some people it's travel for some people it's having losing you know, having losing five want. kilos for me losing five kilos exactly so you know when you actually break it down it's not that they want to lose five kilos it's that they want to feel happy and confident yeah. they want to go to you know they want to think that they they want to feel like they look good and actually in a lot of situations when people do lose five kilos or 10 kilos and they see that they look better they feel more confident and it, it is sometimes a shortcut to some of those feelings so it is understandable why then when they feel bad again I think one of the examples that one of one of my friends often uses who's a coach is like a lot of people say I want to get back to the weight that I was on my wedding day because that was like I was happy then it's like it was your wedding day of course you were happy then it wasn't just the fact that yeah. you fit into a dress that made you happy on that day it was so many other things it was the you know it was before your life got stressful it was you know when you were younger it was when things were fresh and exciting there's so many other other reasons but people often focus on that one sort of aspect because when they look at the picture what they see is what they looked like on that day right yeah awesome well, Mike, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much for joining us and taking the time to chat. We really appreciate your insights. And, uh, yeah, as I learned in Singapore, very useful uh, brain you have. Thanks very much. Likewise. Thank you a lot, Mike. Yeah. Thank you. And guys, appreciate it. We'll be in if, touch uh, for sure. Yeah. If you want to check out Mike, you can find him on Instagram at Dr. Mike the Second. Where else can people find you, Mike? Um, pretty much on all of the social medias at that name. 
do you TikTok? That name. <laughs> I, I do. I don't really post that oh, much on TikTok. Oh, okay. right. it's, You'd um, be a good it's TikToker. A everyone like I. I the feel like platform. everyone's like TikTok's so easy, and then I, I like nothing happens when I post on TikTok. So I, I get. You haven't gone I get viral yet. Easily. No. Maybe you need to bench 102. Yeah, I think exactly. you need to get your bench. Oh my up. god! Yeah, you. That's like that's it. I think you will be happier. Side if you quest. Can get more followers on TikTok. <laughs> Absolutely, that's how it, that's it certainly how it adds seems value, right? Definitely. Uh, all right, thank all right. you guys, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you. You want to stop recording, Samuel? Right. You're recording. Uh, I am recording.